Hello and welcome to our third and final live stream of Zoology Live 2021. I'm Ros Wade, I'm the Learning Officer here at the Museum of Zoology and I've been on your guide on this week as we've explored animals of land, sea and sky. Now if you missed days one and two, you can catch up on YouTube and discover everything from tiny dung beetles to our enormous fin whale skeleton. You can visit our blog, Museum of Zoology blog, all one word, dot com. And you can also find out how to take part in our Cow Pat About Cambridge and Beyond Challenge and our Protest Plastics Challenge as well. These challenges will be running throughout the summer, so there is plenty of time for you to get involved. So back to today's show. Today we are taking to the skies to discover things with wings, more specifically birds and butterflies. Soon we'll be joined by Professor Chris Jiggins, who will be sharing some of the fascinating research into Heliconius butterflies that's taking place here in Cambridge. We'll then be exploring butterflies a bit closer to home as expert Matt Hayes joins us to set our summer butterfly challenge. So get your questions ready for them in the comments on YouTube. We'll be finishing today's live stream with a trip to Mill Road Cemetery to watch and listen for birds with Curator of Ornithology, Dr. Daniel Field. But we're going to start today by looking at some of the specimens that we have on display here at the Museum of Zoology. Here are some of the staff of the museum to share their British bird superstars with you. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Field and I'm the new Curator of Ornithology here at the University Museum of Zoology at Cambridge and I'm excited to show you around the Discovery Room here at the museum where you can see a huge number of the birds that you might be able to see in different habitats around Britain including some rare vagrant species that you might only be able to see on occasion. So as we walk through the Discovery Room we pass through different habitats, for example we look over here we can see a number of the common woodland birds that you might expect to see uh, around Cambridge. Over here we've got Breckland specialties like this incredibly powerful uh, beautiful northern goshawk. Over here we have species that you might be able to see right around the urban parts of Cambridge including the area surrounding the David Attenborough building where the University, of Muse uh, University Museum of Zoology is based. But one of the star species in this display is the common swift, a species which is currently breeding in nest boxes on the side of the David Attenborough building. And of course, common swifts are a very common sight above Cambridge in the breeding season right around now, uh, hawking insects on the wing over even the, uh, the urban center of the city. Um, but they are one of the most fascinating species of birds in the world. They spend about 10 months of the year on the wing, migrating from their breeding sites here at the David Attenborough building to Central Africa, where they essentially fly constantly and never land, catching insects over the rainforests of Central Africa the entire time before returning back north to Europe to breed. Other exciting species that we have around here include species that have only recently regained a foothold in East Anglia, like this incredible great bittern, which is a representative of a species that was extirpated as a breeding species from the British Isles until only relatively recently. So a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, before the fens and wetlands of East Anglia had been drained, the bittern was a very common species around here. And it's only in the last few decades that bitterns have returned to the wetlands of East Anglia, largely as a result of habitat rehabilitation projects uh, across southern England. Who doesn't get incredibly excited when they're walking along a riverbank and spot that distinctive flash of blue and orange that indicates a kingfisher is actually nearby? You're incredibly lucky if you ever see one at rest 
they are highly territorial and spend most of their time uh, flying up and down the riverbanks looking for fish. They have to eat 60% of their body weight each day. And in the spring, a nesting pair will excavate a tunnel 60 to 90 centimeters long uh, along a riverbank. In that, they will lay two to 10 eggs. And when the chicks hatch, they will take up to 25 days, maybe more, to fledge. They have two to three broods per year. And so that's an incredible number of chicks when you think about it, but only a quarter of those will survive until the next year. So the next time you see a kingfisher at rest, it's well earned. For me, a sure sign that summer has arrived is the sight of a common tern flying above the river cam. This migratory species has long tail feathers and has earned itself the nickname Sea Swallow. They arrive with us in April and spend the summer here to breed, leaving us in October to fly all the way back to Africa where they spend our winter months. This species is the most commonly found inland, following the waterways as it goes. So this summer, look out for it along the coast, but also along your local rivers and lakes. If you're lucky, you might see it hover and then plunge into the water to catch a fish. This impressive specimen next to me is a golden eagle, and I'm always amazed that there are birds this size flying around in the UK with several hundred breeding pairs, mainly in the remote parts of Scotland. That's quite a long way for this specimen to reach us here at the Zoology Museum in Cambridge. And actually every specimen we have on display here has its own story as to how it did make its way to us. So sadly this female golden eagle actually flew into some power lines in Scotland, uh, after which she was then found and taxidermy to preserve her. She then spent about 20 years taking up quite a lot of space in someone's garage before finally being donated to us here. Although it is sad that uh, this animal passed away in the way that it did, the fact that it is now on display here means that more people can learn about these amazing creatures and the challenges that they face. We're going to move now from British birds to something smaller but a bit more exotic. The bright warning colours of Heliconius butterflies from Central and South America have fascinated biologists for over 150 years. Today they provide insights into evolution and genetics. Here Professor Jiggins shares some recent research into these animals and he'll be joining us live in just a few minutes to answer your questions. So do pop them in the comments on YouTube. Hi, so I'm uh, Chris Jiggins. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, butterflies that we study. Uh, so these are Heliconius butterflies. So here's a Heliconius errato. Uh, you can see they're very brightly coloured and they're famous for their bright warning colours, which actually warn predators um, that they're bad to eat. And so they have an enormous diversity of wing patterns and we've spent a lot of uh, time over the years studying the diversity of these wing patterns and the genetic basis of, the, of those. And so we know a lot about, uh, about how they evolve new wing patterns and also how mimicry evolves. So they also evolve to uh, converge uh, and share wing patterns, which, which helps to teach predators um, more readily that they're, that they're bad to eat. So these bright color patterns they have on their wings are a, a, an advertising strategy, basically, to tell the predators that these um, butterflies should be avoided. Now, more recently, um, Erica Castro, who's a Brazilian postdoc in my group, has been working on the um, way in which these butterflies interact with their host plants. So they have a, a fantastic sort of co-evolution with passiflora, so they, they, the caterpillars can only eat the leaves of uh, passiflora plants, so this is the passion vines that we know from passion fruits, so they're useful species for us. But they're also extraordinarily diverse, so there's about five or six hundred species of passiflora, found around the world, but the greatest diversity is in South America, um, where these butterflies are also found. Now, um, the um, passifloras have a huge diversity of leaf shapes, so I'm going to show you a few here. There's a sort of standard leaf there. There's a kind of a, almost like a butterfly-shaped one. Uh, and then 
uh, a, a, a kind of a three lobed one here, and I've got a five lobed one here. So, oh, here we go. Five lobes, there we go. So there's enormous diversity of, uh, of leaf shapes among the passiflorus, and that's thought to be partly an adaptation to avoid being attacked by the butterflies. So the butterflies learn to find the plants with the shape of the leaves, uh, and the more diversity of leaves you, you have, the more difficult it is for the butterflies to, to find their host plants. A few other things that the plants do, so um, some of them have trichomes, so this is a pass one called Passiflora adenopoda, it has tiny little uh, hooks, hooked heads, which are called trichomes, that prevent the caterpillars from eating it. And you can tell this species because it sticks to your shirt a bit like Velcro. So it's got tiny little hooks just like a piece of Velcro, and that prevents the caterpillars from eating it. There are some species that produce um, extra floral nectaries, so these are little glands that produce nectar that attract ants, and that stops the, the ants to uh, eat the eggs and the caterpillars of the butterflies, so that's a good strategy. Uh, and there are other species that have um, structures that look like butterfly eggs, so they have bright yellow structures. And when the, cat, when the butterfly comes along, it thinks, oh, there's eggs here already, I won't lay my eggs on this, on this leaf. And so that also helps to deter the, the, the predation. Um, but perhaps more important than that is an enormous diversity of chemical defences that these, these plants have. So different plant species have different composition of chemicals, uh, and those chemicals deter or even prevent the butterflies from um, feeding on them. The butterflies and the plants have been in this chemical arms race for a very long time. And so the plants produce like many defense compounds that keeps most of the herbivores away, but not heliconinis, because they can actually utilize the chemical defenses of the plants in their own defense. But the plants are also very smart, so they evolve to modify the compounds that the butterflies cannot use. But the butterflies are also very smart and they can produce, they, buy, they can biosynthesize the compounds themselves. So if the plant that don't have the compounds that, can, uh, that they can get, it's available, they can go to another passiflora plant uh, and then they will just biosynthesize uh, these defenses instead of getting from the, the plants themselves. So they balance these two processes uh, between producing the compounds themselves and getting the plant compounds. Erica's work is exciting because it's a form of plasticity. In other words, uh, when the butterfly feeds on one plant, it generates the toxins itself, and it feeds on a different plant, it can use the toxins from um, the plant. So it's sort of, depending on the ecological circumstance, uh, the butterfly can adapt its, its, its ecological strategy. So plasticity is uh, very important generally for organisms. It basically refers to the way that um, a single genotype, in other words, uh, genetically identical organisms, can respond differently to different environmental cues. So that could be in their behavior, uh, or in this case, in their biochemical responses to different host plants. And so plasticity is very important in evolution. It can allow organisms to colonize new niches. And um, we can think about in the, in the butterflies, it allows them to, for example, colonize new host plants and expand the range of plants that they can use. But it could also be important, for example, in organisms adapting to climate change um, by responding to differing environmental cues and altering their responses to those cues. So understanding plasticity is important, both for understanding evolution and the diversity of life, but also thinking about how organ organisms will respond to a changing climate. And now I'm joined live by Chris Jiggins. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> so um, the Heliconius butterflies in your film, they're really beautiful. How, how many different species are there? And they all that brightly coloured? Yeah, they're quite diverse. So there's about, uh, about 50 species in the genus. And they're found all the way from um, sort of southern Brazil and Argentina right up into the southern US. So across th throughout the uh, tropical Americas. And um, yeah, they're all brightly coloured actually. So they all have varying degrees of, of, of these. Um, they're actually cyanogenic toxins that produce cyanide when, when a bird tries to attack them. Um, so yeah, they're all brightly coloured. And there's a great diversity of wing patterns, but then also, as well as the diversity, there's also this sort of convergence due to mimicry. So you find rather distantly related species that look the same and, and then very closely related brothers and sisters that can look very different. 
Uh, that's, I mean, that's fascinating. That's what interested a lot of scientists early on, wasn't it, in, in Helicomius? Yeah, that's right. I mean, these, these are quite big butterflies, uh, as you saw in the film, and they're very brightly coloured. And also, li like many sort of warningly coloured insects, they don't hide. They're not hard to catch, so they fly rather slowly. And that, all of that means they're quite sort of prominent components of the biodiversity of the, of the tropics. You know, people love them in the butterfly farms because they're really mm. brightly coloured and easy to, easy to see. And so that also meant, of course, that the early uh, collectors, you know, in Darwin's time and before that, who went to South America, you know, came back with lots of specimens of these species. And uh, so they were sort of an early um, group of organisms that was studied by evolutionary biologists. And actually, you know, Darwin um, sort of was, was impressed with them as a potential example of you know, evolution in action. Oh, fantastic. So it's great. It's really nice to be sort of continuing that tradition of evolutionary biology, studying the same organisms that yeah. Darwin was so we've, we've got quite a few really interesting questions from our audience. Okay. I'm going to go straight to those. So um, <laughs> Theodore, age eight, asks, what is the lifespan of a butterfly? Oh, well, that's a really interesting question, actually, because, uh, well, it, it, it varies enormously. So typically people think that, that the, the adult form of the butterfly lives rather a short time, right? So that's the sort of typical view that they just live for a few days and they mate and lay eggs and then die. And that's... That is true of many species. But even in the UK, there are some adult butterflies that live a long time. So if you think of a peacock, then the adult peacock lives through the winter. You might have, in a wood pile or something, you might have come across a peacock butterfly that's hibernating. So that butterfly would live for, you know, eight, six or eight months maybe, because it lives through the winter. Now, Haliconias are interesting because they're quite unusual. They actually live for a very long time, up to six or eight months, but they're actually reproducing throughout that time. So unlike a peacock, they're not hibernating. They're, they're out there in the forest and and, uh, and sort of learning their way around the forest and uh, finding their plants and, and, and laying eggs for up to eight months, which is very unusual, actually. Yeah. So Henry asks, um, but the, the butterflies in the video, they have very different wing shapes to British butterflies. Why is that? Because they're really kind of long and wide, aren't they? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, and actually... Uh, that's also typical of these warningly coloured species. They often have quite thin, small bodies and long, thin wings. And it's associated with sort of flying rather slowly and showing off your wing patterns. So most British species are relatively edible and uh, they want to zoom out of the way if a predator comes. And they have short, stubby wings that make them very manoeuvrable and agile and fast yeah. flying, whereas Haliconius have this sort of strategy of just sort of flying rather more slowly and showing off because they're less afraid of the predators. Oh, so, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. So Jean asks, how is climate change affecting the butterflies oh, and the plants they feed on? So is climate change affecting the... the, the That's the a really good question. And, I, and I, you know, to be honest, I think in, in South America where we work, I think we just don't know because we just mm -hmm. don't have enough information really. We don't really have, you know, there's lots of collections from Darwin's time, but the, the, the localities are often really vague. It's quite hard to kind of map precise distributions for long enough in the tropics to really track changes. I mean, there are some good examples where that's been done. I mean, of course, you know, as you may know, British butterflies have been a, a really well-studied group for studying responses to climate change. And, and we understand a lot about how British butterflies have responded. Some have done well and expanded their ranges, others are, are suffering. So, um, but, but in the tropics, we, re we really know remarkably little about that. And um, what are the conditions needed for a butterfly to lay eggs? Oh yeah, that's another good question. So they have very um, specific host plant requirements generally. So most butterflies would only feed on one or a few host plants, plant species. And so in the case of the Haliconius, they, you know, they all feed on sort of passive flora, but even within that, you know, one butterfly species might feed on just one or a few passive flora species. And, and they, um, they use the leaf shape to find the plants. So you can actually see, sometimes you can see a butterfly swooping down through the forest to a, to a little tiny little leaf. You know, it's amazing how they, they kind of remember where the location of these, these plants are. And they find the, the leaves and then they use chemical cues to decide whether this is a good plant or not. So they actually have little sort of reduced legs, which they tap the plant with and, uh, and they can taste the plant like that with their, with their legs and decide whether it's a good leaf or not. 
Wow, it sounds like an amazing, different kind of lifestyle to, <laughs> to what you do. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, got a question. Are there any harmful species of butterfly? I mean, I guess things like heliconius, if it produces cyanide when you eat it, that's quite harmful. <laughs> yeah, but people don't normally go around eating butterflies. So, <laughs> so butterflies actually, you know, they, they, they can only feed through a proboscis, right? So they, mm -hmm. they, they can't really bite or anything like that. So, so yes, if you go around eating them, some of them, would, that would not be a very good idea, but that most of them won't do you any harm. There are some moths with caterpillars that have... Um, um, you know, spines that can be quite toxic, um, so they're best avoided. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shilpa asks, uh, do butterflies see only specific colours? Also, do different species see different colours and have different behavioural patterns? Oh yeah, that's a great question as well. So, so most butterflies can see um, probably see the similar colors to us they don't have we have very good distinction between red and green actually red and green are very close together in the, the spectrum of light but because we have detection molecules that, that differentiate them we see them as very different colors butterflies probably wouldn't differentiate those quite so well but they do have a much wider range of sensitivity so they actually are sensitive to UV light so they can see UV colors that we can't see and interestingly, in Haliconius, they've actually duplicated the gene that detects the UV light. So they've got two slightly different sensitivities. So that's, they can actually see in the UV a bit like the way we see red and green. So actually, they could actually see subtly different colors that we would be completely unaware of. Um, and it's been shown that, uh, that those genes are actually expressed differently in males and females. So actually, it's only females that express both of them. So that suggests, I think initially we, when that was, this was discovered, we thought they might be involved in you know, males finding mates, but actually it's perhaps more likely the females finding the plants to, to lay their eggs on, but where the, the colors of the different UV reflection of different leaves in the, in the rainforest might be really important for finding the right eggs plant. So I think it's really wild to think about, you know, not just being able to be sensitive to different wavelengths to us, but actually to be able to distinguish subtly different colours in a completely different space of light that, that we can't even detect. It's kind of amazing. To think about. That, is, that is really incredible. Um, so, how do caterpillars and butterflies help the ecosystem? That's another question we've had. Oh, that's a yeah, good question. So many uh, butterflies are pollinators, so they can be important pollinators of plants. And some some plants are sort of adapted specifically to be pollinated by butterflies. So they depend on butterflies. You've probably seen them, them visiting many different flowers in your your garden. So they you know they can be important pollinators. Um, they they you know like all plant feeding insects, they sort of uh, um, control the growth of some plants. They can be pests sometimes. Um, but um, yeah, they, they're part of the ecosystem really. I think it's, sometimes it's hard to say what, they, what their use is. They're just part of that you know, diversity of life out there that, that we see and that we're sort of fascinated by, I guess. I've got a bit of a technical question now. How many okay. chromosomes does a butterfly have? Oh, okay, yeah, so um, the sort of ca canonical number of chromosomes for Lepidoptera, which is the butterflies and moths, is 31. And that's quite stable, so lots of species have 31 chromosomes. Haliconius actually have 21, so they had 10 chromosome fusions at the beginning of their evolution, maybe about 30 million years ago. There were 10 fusing events of these chromosomes sticking together to go from 31 to 21. And then amazingly, that then very little change, so most Haliconius still have 21 chromosomes. So, so on one branch of the evolutionary tree, there were these 10 events of the chromosomes coming together, and then it's not changed since then very much. But there are some species that have, have again, sort of evolved new chromosome numbers. So it's sort of an interesting characteristic because it stays stable for many millions of years and then can evolve very quickly in some lineages. And we just don't really understand why that is at all, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jeff asks, how do butterflies mate? Yeah, okay, so, uh, well, uh, Haliconius, they, they spend, the, typically the males find the females first, so we, we've done a lot of experiments looking at the colours that the males, the way that, the way the males use the colours of the females to find mates. So the, the males will fly, and actually a good strategy for, for catching 
part of like Heliconius is to wave a red rag frantically and they, they sort of can be attracted from very long distances to, to come down and you can catch them. So the males kind of are attracted by the fluttering and the, and the, the movement and the colour. Uh, and then they have this sort of hovering courtship where the, female, the males chase the females and hover over them and, and they have uh, co chemical compounds on their wings, sort of pheromones, that they flutter over the females. Uh, and, then, and then eventually, if the, if the female agrees, they will sort of settle and sit next to each other and the male will bend his abdomen round and, and he has little claspers and they catch onto the, female, the female's abdomen. And then actually, it was in the video, there was a mating pair where they're sort of facing away from each other and they sit for sometimes for several hours like that with sort of stuck, stuck together in the, ab the abdomen. Uh, and the male transfers uh, what's called a spermatophore, which contains the sperm, but also lots of sort of goodies for the female. So it's actually quite a big contribution from the male. It's a big chunky thing full of um, you know, nutrients, but also can contain toxins that the female can use to defend herself or her eggs. Uh, and you know, it's so big actually that you can sometimes you can see the female abdomen has got this huge lump in it, which is the metaphor <laughs> transferred by the male. Wow. So um, another question from Jean is, do you grow these plants in Cambridge as part of your study? So all those, that, the greenhouse, all those plants. And yeah, we actually, when we filmed that video, we just went out to the greenhouse and collected a bunch of different species. And and uh, so Erica, who was in the video, is, is also really interested in the passiflora and she's been building up a bit of a collection in Cambridge. We've got some of those species have come from the botanic gardens because they have a really amazing collection of passiflora actually in the, in the tropical greenhouse mm -hmm. um, and others that we've collected in, in South America. Yeah, so we have quite a different, quite a range of different species. And some of those are important for this, this study that Eric is doing of looking at the biochemical responses of the butterflies to different plants. And um, another question, are there any species of butterfly that fly over the sea? It seems quite an... an... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are, actually. I mean, there are, there are migratory butterflies that uh, travel very long distances. So uh, painted ladies were probably the most mm -hmm. famous in, in the, that we know in this country, and they can come all the way from Africa. So they fly across the Mediterranean, across the English Channel into, into the UK. So they can fly very long distances. Uh, you know, famously, the monarch butterflies travel all the way from Mexico mm. to Canada and then back again every year. But that's not really over the sea, but uh, so it's not quite answering your question. But they are famous for migration. Uh, and actually, I had a friend who was interested in studying uh, the flights, you know, so the way that different uh, butterflies fly. And he, so he wanted to get the kind of be able to film these butterflies flying in a very consistent way. And what he used to do is he used to go out in a boat into the middle of the Lake, Lake Gatun, in, which is the Panama Canal, really, in Panama, uh, and release a butterfly and then chase after it in his little dinghy and film it with this high-speed camera. And that way he could get it flying in a straight line. And then he, he promised me that he then caught them again and released them back where they came from. So, <laughs> um, so Ashwin asks, how do butterflies get their colours? Oh yeah, that's another great question. So they both have both what are called structural colors and also pigment colors. So pigment colors are molecules that have color in them. So, um, you know, things like the carotenoids that make a carrot orange, they're, mm -hmm. they're sort of molecules that reflect light, uh, differential you know, wavelengths of light. But they're also structural colors. So the things like the very shiny, shimmery colors that we see in birds and butterflies are often structural. Uh, and that's that's sort of a colour that's really a, 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 a function of the structure, the micro nano structure, if you like, of the of the cuticle. So it could be layers of different density of cuticle, or it can be little Christmas tree-like structures that reflect the light in a particular way. And by lining those structures up in you know in in line with the um, wavelengths of light, you can generate uh, different colours. Sometimes they're consistent colours like blues, or sometimes they're sort of shimmery, rainbowy kind of colours. So, um, yeah, there's a variety of different ways that the butterflies generate their colours. And my lab has been very interested in actually studying the, 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 how genes control the, the patterns and the distributions of those colours on, on the wings. So, um, Julia, age nine, let's find that question again. Julia, age nine, asks, we have a passiflora. What types of butterfly might we see on it? So oh, well, 
None, I think. <laughs> I'll let you know that's not strictly true. You might see some butterflies visiting the flowers just to get some nectar. Uh, but there aren't any British butterflies that feed on Passiflora. It's, they are not native here. That, that species of Passiflora is, actually, I think Passiflora cerulea is the one that people often grow in their gardens, which is from sort of you know, Argentina, kind of southern South America. Um, so there aren't any native species of, it, of butterflies that, are, that feed on that. If you see one, it might be one escaped from my... No, no, that's definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, um, no, so there aren't any British yeah. butterflies that feed on Passiflora. Now at age seven asks, and I think this is possibly the hardest question, what is your favourite butterfly? I'd find it the hardest question. Uh, well, I, I studied a species called Heliconius Hymera in my PhD, uh, which is found in the sort of mountains in the south of Ecuador. It looks a bit like the one we looked saw in the video, but the colours are inverted, so the yellow is in the forewing and the red is in the hindwing. No, I just think it's a really stunning, bright, beautifully coloured butterfly. So I, I, I'm very fond of that because it was the first species that I studied in my career. Oh. So I mean, that leads on to another question we've got here. Are the species of butterfly different according to the area they live in? So maybe thinking about the Heliconius butterflies, are there different species in different areas? Yeah, so the, well, the, the same, the, what's sort of remarkable about the Heliconius that we haven't really talked about so far is that the same species can change. Uh, so in different areas, they can look really dramatically different. So, um, and that's sort of what, one of the things that made them famous because these are these kind of different geographic forms that have very different wing patterns. A sort of maybe an early stage of the evolution of a new species. Darwin said, you know, this maybe this is as close as we can get to seeing the evolution of a new species. He was very excited about this. So yeah, so even within the range of the same species, you can get populations that look very different. And you know, that's a, a bit like in, in humans, for example, we have different skin colours from different populations, sort of similar kind of thing. Uh, and um, and and then and then the different species also, uh, you know, the in different areas you'd find different groups of species, so different ecological communities. So although I said that they're distributed all that way from the US to, to Argentina, the highest diversity is in the, the sort of the upper Andes, um, the upper Amazon rather, so sort of where the Amazon meets the Andes. And both both of those areas have very different for, fauna, very different groups of species, and where they kind of come together at the base of the Andes, that's the most diverse place in the world for, for, for butterflies generally really, but also for heliconians. Mm. So here we've got a question, I think somebody's been studying this a little bit. Jack, aged 12, wants to ask, why do, caterpill why do caterpillars poo so much that butterflies don't poo at all? <laughs> well, you know, the, the butterflies do most of their eating as caterpillars, you know, as in a very hungry caterpillar. They spend their time, uh, you know, um, eating leaves as caterpillars, so that's why they poo a lot. When they're when they're caterpillars, but when they're adults, they all they have to eat with is a is a proboscis. It's like you you know the only thing you can eat with is a straw. Uh, so mainly they feed on nectar, uh, and if you just feed on nectar, you don't produce very much poo. So uh, there's a very good answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got. Um, I'll just have one more question. We've uh, we've not answered all of them, but some of them I think. Matt Hayes might be able to answer, who's our next expert as well, because about British okay. ones. Um, but one more question. Do butterflies have any sort of communication and language like honeybees do? Honeybees and their sort of waggle dance. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. So, I mean, um, Heliconias are unusual in that they actually learn their way around the forest. And, and because they live such a long time, they memorize the locations of different plants, like the food, the, the flowers and the, the plants they're going to lay their eggs on. And there's an idea that they learn this from each other. Um, there isn't much evidence for that, actually. But, you know, I think it's probably, it's probably a bit hard to prove. But, you know, there's an idea that they follow each other and learn where the plants are through the forest. Um, so, so, yeah, there is some, probably some communication in that way. They also... Um, you know, communicate with chemicals. We talked about a bit about pheromones, uh, and some make noises as well. So some of them sort of click at each other. <laughs> we don't really know much about what that's for, but yeah, wow, noisy butterflies. That sounds great. I, I, I tell that I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, can a butterfly's physical features change over time depending on the environment they're living in? That just sounded quite an interesting question to me. 
Uh, yeah, so butterflies are famous for plasticity, actually, which is in their wing patterns, which is sort of they produce different wing patterns either in different seasons or, or, in, or in different uh, places. And, you know, there's a famous sort of African butterfly that's been studied that has lots of eye spots in the wet season and none at all in the dry season. Uh, actually, there's some species here, so the comma butterfly looks slightly different um, in different times of the year. But um, that's, that's sort of a butterfly, the adult butterfly can't change its wing patterns once it's, once it's made. So that is a decision that's made when it's a caterpillar and it's often determined by temperature or day length and that determines what the adult's going to look like but the, once it's emerged then it's stuck with that pattern it can't change it again <laughs> so it's a sort of you know during the development and actually in the cat inside the caterpillar there are these little um balls of tissue called um, wing discs which are going on to produce the wings of the adult so they actually the, the wings of the adult are all already developing as, as little structures inside the caterpillar uh, and so the decision about what they're going to look like is made in the caterpillar and the pupa uh, and the adult, once it comes out, is stuck with that. It can't change again. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. It's been really, really fascinating. I've really enjoyed learning more about butterflies and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what else comes out of your lab. It's really fascinating research. Well, thank you very much. They're a brilliant set of questions. So uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks a lot to everyone. <laughs> okay. So walk around Cambridge and you are unlikely to see a Helicomius butterfly, but there are many beautiful British butterfly species you might spot showcasing some fascinating behaviour. Now here is Matt Hayes from the museum to show us more and Matt will be joining us live in just a few minutes to answer your questions, so do pop them in the comments. Hello, my name is Matt Hayes and I'm a research assistant at the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. For audio descriptive purposes, I am a white male in my mid-twenties and I'm stood in my garden on a sunny day. Seeing butterflies on the wing is usually a surefire sign that warmer weather has arrived and I hope for most of us they're a common sight during spring and summer. One of my favourite things about butterflies is that they actually tend to avoid the very worst of the weather and only really come out between 10 and 4, making them the perfect study species for fieldwork. Butterflies are relatively large, colourful and free-flying insects, which means that they're quite easy to observe. This means that they've captured the imagination of people for centuries and they have a really long history of recording, especially in the UK. As well as being a fun hobby, butterfly recording can also give us lots of really helpful data. Butterflies have a complex life cycle with several different distinct life stages. They start off as an egg before turning into a caterpillar, which then forms a chrysalis. And finally, they undergo metamorphosis into an adult butterfly. These different distinct life stages can sometimes have very different specific requirements. And that means that butterflies can be very sensitive to even small environmental changes. This means they are a useful indicator species, and if you see a change in the number of butterflies around you, this could indicate that there's a wider problem in the general environment. What that means is if you look after your butterfly populations, you can actually look after a whole host of different species at the same time. Going a step further, if we record extra details about the butterflies we see, we can learn even more. For example, noting down their behaviour when we see them can tell us a lot about what they're up to. Some behaviours are very easy to spot, and we might simply note down that a butterfly was flying when we saw it. Other behaviours can be a little trickier to tell apart, but you may well come across butterflies resting or basking between bouts of activity. When a butterfly lands, it may need to heat back up before taking off and power its energetically demanding flight muscles by basking in the sun. Usually, they will do this by opening their wings wide and orientating themselves to directly face the sun. They will even follow its movements over the course of the day as it moves across the sky. On the other hand, if the butterfly is just resting, then it is more likely to be facing away from the sun, and most species will have their wings closed. Another important behaviour that can be observed is nectaring. When an adult butterfly needs to feed, it will visit a flower to suck up the sweet nectar inside. This also makes butterflies important pollinators, although bees tend to get most of the credit. There are other behaviours that are not exhibited by all butterfly species, but can be particularly impressive to observe. 
Some species hold territories where a male will sit and perch, waiting for a passing female to fly through, as with this speckled wood butterfly. However, if another male flies past, this can lead to a territorial spiral flight to let the intruder know the territory is taken. The males will fly around each other in tight circles, often rising up into the air together, before the territory holder settles back down. Other species don't hold territories, and instead, males fly around patrolling for females. Whether you're a territory holder or a patroller, when a male intercepts a female, this can lead to a courtship flight, where the two fly away together to mate, as with these brimstone butterflies. Finally, once they have landed, you may even see a pair of butterflies mating end to end. Or you may see a female ovipositing, where she curls her body beneath herself to lay her eggs on a plant. So there you have it, a few different behaviours to look out for when you're observing butterflies in the wild. And now I'm joined live by Matt Hayes. Hi Matt. Hi Rose. So you work on the butterfly collections here in the museum. What can they tell us about the butterflies that we can see today? Yeah, well the great thing about our museum collections, especially our insect collections and the butterflies we have here, is that we have such a large number from across the world, uh, including many UK specimens uh, from the last 200 years. And what that means is we, we basically have what is effectively a sort of time machine and we can see species that used to live um, in different locations across the UK and beyond and see where and when they lived. And you can compare that with the species that are still around today and you can see how much things have changed. So. Sometimes there's been increases, which are, that's obviously a nice story when populations are on the rise, but unfortunately it's more common that we have a lot of specimens in museum stores from locations where they no longer exist. So as some examples, we've got things like the large copper butterfly and the swallowtail butterfly, which were collected from Cambridgeshire about 150 years ago. Um, and today they're nationally or locally extinct. So you can begin to see those massive changes but it's not all doom and gloom because then once you know things have changed you can begin to think why and that can inform modern day conservation so th those two species lost a lot of their habitat and lots of conservation organizations today are bringing that habitat back so basically this historical time machine shows us what's changed and we can do something about it which i think is a positive thing great so i'm going to go straight to our audience questions because we've got sure. some really great ones uh, we're going to start with a couple that we couldn't answer before as well. Uh, so if we find any butterfly unable to fly, should we make it drink water? It's one of the questions. Oh, got. interesting. So certainly with um, bees as well, uh, one of the things you can do is provide them with sugar water. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a little kind of dish of sugar water out, make sure you have something like pebbles in it as well, in case they fall in so they can climb back out. Mm -hmm. um, adult butterflies don't live very long usually, um, so it might just be that they are coming to the kind of natural end of, of their life cycle, but hopefully they'll have mated and laid eggs for the next generation. But certainly they, they drink nectar normally, kind of very sugary uh, substance. So some sugar water could help them. If they're just having a bad day, maybe a drink will give them some energy. So yeah. Okay, uh, Timothy H9 asks, which plant would you recommend buying to attract the best or most butterflies? <laughs> the best butterflies. They're the best good. butterflies, yeah. Um, so perhaps the one that springs to mind is a bit is a bit strange. There's there's two things you can you can do. You could aim to support the adult butterflies, or you could aim to support the caterpillars. And actually, the caterpillars, the best plant to have, weirdly, one of the best plants is nettles. So although they they sting and potentially are seen as a weed a lot of the time, a lot of our most well-known butterfly species, so peacock butterflies, small tortoise shell, red admiral, a lot of them uh, use them as their food plant for their caterpillars. Uh, and around this time of year, actually, you will be able to see them uh, in certain parts of Cambridge and across the UK in sunny patches, you'll see these clumps of caterpillars. So maybe don't go out buying nettles, potentially you can, um, but if you see um, some nettles growing in your garden, if you're lucky enough to have your own green space, if they're in a sunny patch, consider actually leaving them where they are and uh, you may attract uh, some butterfly species to your garden. Certainly they're a refuge for loads of other animals as well and other insect species. And yeah, for the adults, I would say it's actually best to have a range of flowering plants for them. The best thing you can do for butterflies and pollinators is have flowers that bloom throughout the year. Uh, so it's unlikely just one flower will really do that. So it's good to have a selection of things, something that blooms in spring, something in the summer and something in the autumn. 
And if you go on Butterfly Conservation's website, it's a great charity in the UK, they have a full list of kind of nectaring plants for butterflies and it tells you when they flower. Um, so that would be my advice, yeah. Okay, so uh, really great advice on how to yeah, support butterflies in your green spaces there. Theodore88 has asked, what is the rarest butterfly in Britain? Yes, yeah, so there's probably a few, um, a few options for that. I think one of the ones that's had some of the worst declines uh, over the last few decades and certainly recent years is something called the high brown fritillary. A lot of our woodland butterflies have done really poorly recently because it used to be in this country that we managed woodlands um, by coppicing them. And what that means is people would go in and cut a line out of the, out of the dense woodlands to create space and that allowed plants within that space to grow up. And a lot of the butterflies in the UK like those plants. As time's gone on, that isn't such an economical way to, to farm anymore. And a lot of those spaces have actually closed up. And because those spaces have closed up, the food plants of those uh, butterflies have also closed up and the butterflies have disappeared. So the high brown fertility, unfortunately, is a huge decline. It's something like 95% of its former sites in, in the UK have, have, have dropped off. Um, but on the other side of things, we've got rare species that are actually coming to the UK for the first time. So we've got things moving across the channel as climate warms up. So uh, potentially there are, there are other rarities like that. I think there's um, a butterfly called the, well, there's two, there's the short tail and the long tail blue. And some of those are gradually moving, uh, get, having larger numbers come to the UK every year as things warm up. So. Although, yeah, some are declining and becoming rare because of that. Some are currently rare, but hopefully it will, will get larger numbers soon. And as a sort of the opposite of that question, Noah wants to ask, what's the most common butterfly in Britain? Yes, Britain? another good question. Um, probably the meadow brown. It depends what habitat you're looking at. And again, sadly, this is a species which has had declines, but still, as the name suggests, any meadow area, any kind of grassy area, you're likely, this time of year as well, it's a proper summer butterfly, you're likely to see really high numbers of them. And certainly I, I go on field work to nature reserves in the local area, but also just around my house, I've seen in the last couple of weeks meadow browns suddenly start popping up. Um, yeah, although they're not as abundant as they used to be, there's still loads of them around, which is good. Okay. Madeline asks, is it true that caterpillars turn into living soup in the cocoon before becoming a butterfly? Great question. Yeah, this is probably my favourite fact I like to tell people uh, about butterflies because it's, it's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, when a caterpillar forms, forms uh, a chrysalis, it uh, then yeah, undergoes metamorphosis into an adult butterfly. And I, I've known that, I think a lot of us know that for a long time. But perhaps I, originally I kind of thought maybe the caterpillar just sort of grew wings. But no, just as you said, the, um, the caterpillar releases some enzymes to actually start to digest its own body tissue. It sounds like a really weird thing to do, but the caterpillar breaks itself down and it does. It forms a sort of lumpy soup where some of the organs or kind of clumps of cells remain intact, but it's definitely more of a kind of lumpy liquid than it is a kind of solid animal. And then the organs will reform into similar or the same organs in the adult butterfly. But basically from this soupy stage, it will then yeah, develop its new body shape into an adult butterfly, which is amazing. And some research actually shows that some form of primitive memory transfers from, can transfer from caterpillars through soup into an adult butterfly, which is also just astonishing. Um, so I think they tested caterpillars with um, something like a, a certain smell and they gave them a little electric shock. And then when uh, they looked at the adults, they um, produce the same smell for the, for the adult butterflies to smell. And the ones that had the electric shock, I think, recoiled from, from that smell. And I think that's how they tested it. But certainly, uh, it's amazing. They completely reform from soup. Yeah. So we've had a couple of questions about the ancestors of butterflies. So what are the ancestors of butterflies? And do they share an ancestor with any other creatures? So what are they, what are they related to? Yeah. Um, Butterflies have been around for a really long time, much, much longer than, uh, than humans. And um, we have some really, really old, let's say we, that there are some really, really old specimens in amber of something that very much like butterflies, I think upwards of 300 million years ago. Um, and it's thought that potentially they were around at the same time as 
something that looked like a butterfly was around at the same time as, um, as dinosaurs. And what's really fascinating is that some of our fossil evidence or amber evidence for butterflies predates some of the evidence for flowers. Flowers don't preserve very well because they're very soft tissue. So some people are suggesting, okay, if there's no flowers around, what are the butterflies uh, drinking? And potentially, I don't really think this is entirely true, but one, some people have suggested they drink dinosaur tears, which I doubt would be their entire <laughs> diet. But I love the idea of butterflies going around drinking dinosaur tears. So yeah, they've been around for millions of years, um, butterflies, for a long time. Mm. Um, yeah, they share um, ancestors with, with other insects. Um, butterflies have changed um, quite a lot. I think um, Chris Jiggins was talking about how they have kind of scales covering their wings, and that's quite different from other, other species. Mm. Some of the first flying insects were things that looked more like dragonflies, so they would have appeared in the air before butterflies. And things like silverfish and bristletail. Silverfish, those little things you sometimes get in old books. Um, they, those are kind of root insects that don't have wings, but potentially the first insects maybe looked a little bit more like that. It's hard to tell because obviously these are, they've all evolved so much since, but uh, they do check on ancestors with other, with other insects if you go far enough back. So is a moth considered a type of butterfly? Oh, so these are great questions. Um, I would say yes. So Butterfly Conservation is a charity um, that I mentioned already. And on their website, they say, it's almost the other way around. It's more that a yeah, butterfly is a type of moth. So strangely, mm -hmm. there's about 60 species or so of butterflies in the UK, but there's upwards of two and a half thousand species of moth, which is yeah, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and they share many, many similarities. So they both belong to the same, same group called Lepidoptera, and as we mentioned before, it's because they've got scales on their, on their wings. They're called the scaly-winged um, kind of insects. So they're, they're very similar in, in that respect. It's just that butterflies are a, a group within moths, really, and because they tend to be very colorful and come out during the day, um, we've, we've given them a, a slightly different group. But there are lots of very colorful butterfly, um, very colorful moths that also come out during the day as well. So that's not really a good distinction. So I would say, yeah, it, you're, you're pretty much right if you say that as a butterfly is a kind of moth. Okay, so that answered quite nicely Julia's question, which was how many species of butterfly are there in the UK? UK? Uh, yeah. so that was about, <laughs> about 60. Um, so uh, do butterflies have a social life? Do they have friends? <laughs> what a lovely question. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, they certainly interact with each other. Mm. I. It, it's probably more documented when they interact in, I guess, more of an adversarial way as, as competitors. Um, some butterflies, uh, or uh, unlike things like bees, they don't live in big groups. They tend to be kind of more solitary, but they certainly will come across other, other butterflies. Some males hold territories, but they will perch somewhere and sit and wait, and hopefully wait for a female to fly through. And if they see a female fly through, they'll, they'll take off and intercept the female and, and try and mate. Um, but it can be that a certain territorial spot is really, really good, so lots of males can compete for it, or at least be in the same area, and that forms something called a lek. Um, so there's a species I study called the Duke of Burgundy butterfly, which does form these kind of lek areas. And I wouldn't say they're friends, but there certainly it can be groups of maybe four or five males in the best spots, mm -hmm. and every time one of them takes off, another one will intercept it, and they'll have a little competition and fly around, and then, and then fly back down. Um, Pheromone trails are also really important to, to butterflies and other insects, so they'll be able to, with their antennae, they'll be able to um, detect other uh, butterflies, females and males around them. So they're aware of each other, whether or not they're friends, I'm not too sure. Okay, I've got two more questions for you. So Theandra, age 12, asks, when does a visit visiting butterfly become a native butterfly? Oh, that's a, these are fantastic questions. Um, mm. So one, one sort of general rule, I guess you could, you could say, is whether or not they come and breed in the UK um, and they get established. That's, that's how you might say it becomes a resident. If it um, yeah, travels to the UK, successfully breeds and the population starts. But if you, the idea of something being an invasive species you may have heard of is, is something that's maybe come across relatively recently and is established and um, is potentially causing harm to the environment that it's in. The problem with that definition is if you go far enough back, um, 
everything was at one point a new species in, in an area really because everything moves around and, and shifts but I would say yeah getting getting established and having a breeding population is quite a good indicator of whether or not something has set up uh, more permanently that being said some of our um, kind of most famous butterflies things like red admirals and painted ladies they migrate to the UK every year and then reproduce here so it's not a hard and fast rule either because then they travel away again as, as well but yeah if you can breed here successfully I think that's quite a good sign of getting established. Okay, I'm actually going to, for the last one, combine two questions together because okay. we just had a really interesting one come through. So Lisa asks, are there any species that stay as caterpillars? And Rob, aged 30, says, I've been reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar to my oh, son Eli. Brilliant. Would caterpillars actually eat Swiss cheese and salami given the chance? <laughs> oh, again, these, these, are, these are brilliant questions. Um, would, would a butterfly stay as a caterpillar? I don't, I don't think so. I think something's probably gone wrong if it stays as a, as a caterpillar. Um, a caterpillar's main job is to eat and eat and eat and eat and grow big enough to pupate and turn into an adult butterfly. And the adult butterfly's job really is then to find a mate and restart the process. Um, there are some interesting examples in nature where um, some species kind of stay in their larval form. Mm -hmm. So the one that springs to mind, I think there's a thing called an axolotl, which is basically it's kind of like a salamander kind of thing that looks a bit like a newt and the axolotl doesn't it seems to stop maturing and it's it, it stays looking like a juvenile which is quite strange so there are there are examples in nature where it sort of something does stop at the at the larval or juvenile stage so it's not unheard of but i think most caterpillars eventually turn into uh, adult butterflies will will caterpillars eat swiss cheese and salami there are lots of different caterpillars for moths and sawflies and butterflies as well and some of them, I'm sure, will eat will eat meat <laughs> and different things. I've not, I've never tried those food sources myself, um, but there are certainly cannibalistic caterpillars, and not all of them eat plants. Mm -hmm. um, so quite possibly, give it a go. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Matt. That's been really, really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to going out and doing some butterfly spotting this summer. So this summer, we would really like your help in recording butterflies. Take part in our butterfly challenge, upload the pictures of your sightings and we'll enter you into our butterfly competition. Here's how to get involved. If you want to have a go recording butterfly behaviours for yourself, why not take part in our Zoology Live butterfly challenge? Take a picture of any butterfly that you see and submit it using the Google form on our website. Click the Add File button to browse your files and find the image that you want to upload. There is then space on the form to note down other details, such as the name of the butterfly, where you saw it, and what it was doing. The Google form should be accessible via a smartphone as well as a computer. Where the form asks, what species of butterfly have you photographed, please write your best guess. If you do not know the species, that is not a problem, and you can simply write butterfly instead. Alternatively, if you would like some help identifying a butterfly, please follow the link on the form to the Butterfly Conservation's Identify a Butterfly Guide. If you are unsure about an identification, please tick the Unsure box on the form. This is not a problem, but just lets us know. The form will then ask, where did you see the butterfly? When recording the location, try to be as specific as possible. For example, you might write, East corner of Parker's Peace, Cambridge, under trees, or front garden on Mill Road, Cambridge. Using Google Maps can be a helpful tool for narrowing down the location. Being specific will help us upload the butterfly sightings onto a map using the wildlife recording website iRecord. This will allow you to see where the different species have been spotted once the butterfly challenge ends. The next question asks, what was the butterfly doing and provides multiple choice answers for you? Simply select the behaviour you saw the butterfly doing. Do not worry if your picture does not show it doing the behaviour that you select. Finally, if you would like your butterfly sightings to be included in the Zoology Live 2021 Butterfly Challenge, please add your name and email address in the last two sections of the form. Then click Submit. Do you want some tips on where to go looking for butterflies? 
and other wildlife in Cambridge. Well, we've got you covered. Our new Cambridge Wildlife Safari shows some top wildlife sites across the city. Explore the green spaces and unexpected wildlife havens around Cambridge City this summer. Observe pollinating bees and butterflies, hunt for beetles under logs or listen to the birds sing. Our Cambridge Safari Trail has 14 wildlife spots across the city to choose from. Look out for the brown spots as these are excellent places to get involved in our Cow Pats About Cambridge Summer Challenge. See our blog site for more information. You can find the trail on our blog too and either access it on a smartphone or download and print a PDF version. Happy exploring! One of the sites on our wildlife safari map is Mill Road Cemetery, which is a great place for spotting birds. We're going to finish today with a tour there from our curator of ornithology, Dr. Daniel Field. Before that, I want to say a huge thank you to Matt and to Chris and all of our experts this week, and to all of you for watching and asking some truly brilliant questions. We hope you've enjoyed Zoology Live 2021. And remember, all of our challenges are taking place throughout the summer. So there is plenty of time for you to spot butterflies, dissect cowpats, and create protest plastic sculptures to share with us. So on that note, here's our bird tour of Mill Road Cemetery and happy wildlife watching. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel Field. I'm the curator of ornithology at the Museum of Zoology. And this is Mill Road Cemetery, which is a really nice site for bird watching right in the city center in Cambridge. I've got a song thrush singing right behind me here. Um, throughout the entire lockdown, I was lucky enough to live just around the corner of Mill Road Cemetery. So I've brooded it quite regularly over the last year or so and seen over 50 species here over the course of the year. And in a typical morning, you can easily see about 20 species on a nice walk around Mill Road Cemetery. So let's see what we can find. A blackbird just went over and there's one singing up at the top of this tree here. So now in the breeding season, blackbirds and song thrushes are kind of very easy to see. In the winter, um, this can be a good place for red wing. Um, if there's a good berry crop on the holly bushes, for example. So last winter, there are often red wings around. We even had field fair pass through a couple of times. So these tall trees sometimes attract woodpeckers, both great spotted woodpecker and uh, green woodpecker, which you can sometimes see hopping um, in amongst the, uh, the, the gravestones, but usually when the grass is a little bit shorter, so it's easier for them to find insects. And in the summertime, those swifts are always flying around. It's a great place to come, um, especially right towards dusk, uh, where you can see them gathering in, in big groups and sometimes flying very low uh, right over your heads in the cemetery. There's the, one of the chip chaps is still calling here going. Occasionally uh, in spring migration, there've been willow warbler here as well, which of course look a lot like chip chaff, but their song is very different. Another sort of useful way to delineate between chip chaff and, and willow warbler is the behavior of the birds. So they're sort of behavioral field marks. So if you see one of these small leaf warblers and its tails moving up and down constantly, that's more likely to be a chip chaff than a willow warbler. There are a few green finches around very close. Hopefully we'll be able to get a glimpse of one. Oh, there's one just flew low right along the path and, and flew into the U in front of us. There we go. You won't get a better look of a, at, a, at a song thrush than that, perched right up in the middle on, uh, on one of the tombstones. That's great. We'll see if it lets us get a little closer. Yeah, right here in the middle, this is the most open spot of the cemetery. I think there used to be a little church here. Um, and this can be a good place to wait for a rafter to come over. I don't know if we'll be lucky enough to see one today. Um, certainly Sparrowhawk is the most common rafter seen here. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there are buzzards uh, relatively frequently, red kites now and then. 
sometimes even falcons, like kestrels and peregrine falcon, will pass over. So this is the most likely part of the cemetery here with these nice coniferous trees um, to find species like gold crests. So because we're right in the middle of the city, uh, there's some groups of house sparrows and starlings and uh, feral pigeons that do very well uh, right around here and also use the cemetery. So it can be a good place for warblers as well, so black caps bred right underneath that beautiful beech tree, that big purple beech tree at the back. A uh, great tit coming in, calling right here. It looks like a young bird, so maybe we'll see its parents around as well. Great tit. Very vocal blackbird up in this plane tree. So right in the middle of a big flock of sparrows. There's a jackdaw going over. That's the first one that we've seen today. Quite a few sparrows around. Some of them are young, so this one perched here. Looks like a recently fledged bird. Seems like the sparrows have been doing pretty well. Agitated song thrush. Concerned about the magpie, it sounds like. Wonder if the magpie is getting too close to its nest. Magpie seen off by the song thrush there. So this big holly over here, this was sort of the center of thrush activity in the winter. So we had uh, those winter migrant red wings feasting on a, a good crop of holly berries in this tree, often attended also by blackbirds and uh, song thrushes. Over here, this was uh, a very active spot earlier in the spring because a pair of long-tailed tits actually made their nest right in the middle of this bramble. It's grown up too much now to actually see the nest, but it's a really amazing construction. It's, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Um, made of things like moss and spider webs. It's amazing and uh, they seem to have raised at least six or seven chicks um, that managed to, to fledge. And this edge here with the lime trees in the back and the horse chestnut here, oftentimes these trees have big flocks of finches uh, in the winter. Uh, gold finches were really abundant this past winter. Nice to hear the wren singing here, even above the construction noise. That song is incredible. It's one of the most complex bird songs in, in all of nature. If you see a sonogram of the, uh, of the wren song, you see it's incredibly complicated. They're actually singing with both sides of their syrinx, the equivalent of their voice box, at the exact same time. So to make that incredibly fast pace, um, very complex song, they're really kind of doing an incredible amount of work in this amazingly coordinated way. Um, and of course, this is a tiny, tiny songbird, uh, just a few grams uh, in mass, capable of generating this massive, really, really noisy sound. Um, it is an incredible, incredible feat. Here's a dunnock singing right at the entrance to the cemetery here. So it's interesting just to be able to see year after year how kind of the, the use of this cemetery by different species of birds changes. Um, I know back in the 70s, apparently there were tawny owls that actually bred here in the cemetery. They're gone now, unfortunately. Um, but it is a nicely managed um, urban green space. So who knows what might move in to breed in, in future years.